into the cloud now. So we call these sessions um, reactivated sessions. And all that really is, is that we've delivered webinars on all of these topics previously, and you can access all of those previous resources and recordings. And now we've revisited them um, with new guest speakers and uh, a more active and participatory experience, hopefully. So more flipped, more focused on activities and more rooted in real world experience with additional um, guest speakers and so on. There's a link on the screen here to the journeys or mini courses that we created in the, the first running of the project and you can access those and there's a step-by-step -step guide to how to do that. When you registered, we asked you to share what you most wanted to learn from this session. And Lillian, you did a bit of quick analysis of what the key points were, didn't you? Yeah, I think most of you are, uh, you know, wanting to understand some of the key principles of accessibility um, and, and how technology can help to support accessibility. Um, we've had some uh, interesting um, uh, requests for debates around good design versus good accessibility. I'm not sure we can exactly cover that in this session, maybe at the end, but most people want to uh, understand how to be more inclusive with an increase in online teaching because of COVID, how to take account of people with visual impairments, mental health, dyslexia, um, how to improve engagement for students with barriers. Um, most people are after some insights, ideas and evidence. Um, and quite a few people are after strategies for implementing inclusive teaching practices, you know, how we develop staff uh, to adopt more inclusive practice. And um, uh, so, yeah, and a um, couple of things we may not be able to cover in this session, uh, specifically on captions. Uh, you may want to join the Digital Accessibility Regulations JISC mail list, which we'll put a link to in the chat later um, to, to find out more about that. Um, and interactive tools for online group work. Again, some of our previous webinars and resources might be useful for anyone interested in, in that. So yeah, that's it. And it is worth us saying that um, it's, although we're going to be focusing on our guest speakers this session, there's a learning resource that accompanies this session uh, with 33 different slides in it. So you see the original uh, one with all the interactivities with loads of links, lots of reading, referencing, all sorts of uh, even activities in there that you can play with. So I think that's us ready to introduce our first speaker. So um, I'd like to introduce Andy and Mike from the University of Lincoln. And they're going to be talking to us. In fact, we've tried to take a bit of a spectrum over this session, looking at strategy, also looking at practice and looking at um, kind of macro scale, micro scale as well. So Andy and Mike are going to talk about their strategic approach to accessibility training. Thank you, Alistair. Um, thank you for that introduction and thank you uh, to, to inviting us to come and talk today. We're going to share our story over the last couple of years. Uh, we're going to rattle through a lot of information, but we will have uh, examples that we can leave you with if you want to have a look at what we've done uh, and uh, make your own judgments on and how useful they, they may be for your, for your own practice. Uh, okay, so as uh, Alison mentioned, my name's uh, Andy Begg, I'm the Dean of Digital Education at Lincoln and Mike is in my team and Mike has been the lead uh, trainer and support for accessibility and its uh, inclusion within teaching and learning particularly at the University of Lincoln. And so as I mentioned we we're going to talk about uh, kind of our journey and it began really September 2018 when the new EU regulations came out or certainly when we became aware of them. I think up until then we've been very focused as an institution on GDPR and I think many other institutions had, and we'd, we had, to our, to our regret, uh, missed the, uh, the new legislation around uh, uh, web accessibility. And it came a bit of, bit of a surprise to us when we, when we noticed it in September. But we, uh, we accepted and recognized that this was an important uh, activity to, to embrace. And we began by uh, initially rolling out training support in lynda.com or LinkedIn Learning uh, to all staff and promoted it uh, alongside all of the uh, mo their module sites on Blackboard, our BLE. So it's there front and centre, 
here's some resources to make your, your learning materials more accessible. But you can see that in two years that it was running and we, we promoted it there, we had three completions. And regrettably, Mike and myself were two of those completions. So it wasn't the most successful uh, of initiatives. Uh, we also started rolling out webinars, but they were very, uh, and uh, workshops, but they're very much on the, those who are willing to engage with us. And so we went um, to any session that would have us uh, to promote and share uh, the importance, like the school meetings, college meetings, or whatever. But it's very much on an invite uh, basis. Uh, one of the early successes was around creating a checklist, which uh, uh, you can see here, which was something that we wanted to have on the, the staff could have on the side of the desk and we gave it away in an A5 flyer format. We said it as PDFs, we make links to it on the web page, put it in emails. So we really tried to promote, uh, these are some simple things that you can do to uh, enable your practice. But again, I would say that the impact of that was really towards uh, the engaged and those who wanted to know how to do this better and were working with us to do so. Uh, we also looked at our web um, uh, resources and there was a, there was a, a sister project with, alongside of this so about updating uh, the WordPress uh, website that, uh, that we had on all of the web resources that were on there. Uh, but the accessibility really gave us a, an, a, an opportunity to go to uh, sort of areas around the university and encourage them to join in with the update and the, and the migration on, onto the new blog site by building in accessibility within the templates. And that brought uh, an awful lot of people onto the new platform and, and worked with us to consolidate that uh, and colleagues in digital student life so that they could um, take advantage of the inbuilt accessibility that the WordPress site had. But it wasn't until we uh, got strategic uh, oversight, which came from the Vice Chancellor, recognising the, uh, the EU uh, legislation change and the, um, the DVC for student uh, experience, who put, who put together a working group led by uh, an academic, uh, the Dean of the Lincoln Academy of Learning and Teaching, as a way of uh, overseeing a, a university response and um, being more uh, proactive about the steps that we were taking around the support of accessibility and its adoption across uh, all areas of web publishing. So it had a, lot, a whole range of uh, representative groups in there who came together to, to plan about what our actions are going to be. And that was probably just over a year ago um, and one of the first things we did was put on a learning and teaching conference uh, uh, that was around learning technology generally, but one of the strands was around accessibility and we pushed and promoted accessibility directly uh, towards that through, the, through those channels and started to take, be, go out and, and be more uh, proactive about the, the, the support that uh, uh, was needed. And alongside of that, we produced some accessibility toolkits. Now I'll show you the resources here, but we created them on a whole range of topics. Uh, and it covers some of the similar ground that you've probably seen on other resources, but these were developed by ourselves and branded uh, uh, by ourselves. Uh, and, and that local development has seen a, a greater level of adoption. For whatever reason, uh, being part of the uh, Lincoln suite of supported resources has seen uh, their use increase. And uh, these are all made available on Creative Commons license, but it covers a whole range of things around why you'd want to do this, tips that you want to avoid. And it's very much an extension of the checklist that I showed earlier, a kind of a real enabling uh, development of how you do these things rather than a list of these are the things that you should do. So, and it gives some examples about why the benefits are, are there uh, and how it, the impact of not doing this can be on, your, on, the, on the students. Uh, who are using your resources. And you can see there that uh, the adoption of the, um, the use has, has improved dramatically over what we've, we've managed to achieve with LinkedIn Learning. But the real change was around the mandating of all staff training uh, online resource that all staff uh, in professional services as well as academics have to go through. And that came from the uh, Vice Chancellor supporting this through the working group and was a recommendation and, uh, that went to SLT and was endorsed, as I said, by the Vice Chancellor. So one of the things you can see there, we've, we've already created a whole range of resources and support that we've engaged with the, uh, the willing in to, uh, to, to uh, uh, support 
the, the creation of accessible learning resources. So we didn't want to inadvertently annoy uh, anyone who'd already engaged with us by making them do repeat information. So we took a different tack to this and, and we used the, the Keller model for motivational software arcs, I'm sure some of you are familiar with it, tension, relevance, competence and satisfaction to structure uh, a learning resource that was mandated for all staff to take. Um, the resource is here, um, it covers six key areas and if you go into one of these areas, what we tried to do was really impress upon staff the impact of not doing uh, accessible learning can have on, on uh, their students. So I'll just hopefully very quickly just jump in. The screen reader software reads out everything that is on screen. When I study from PowerPoint presentations, the screen reader sometimes gives me alternative text for pictures, but sometimes the document these resources are available uh, on afterwards, uh, but you can see there, there's a, there was a, uh, a presentation of a scenario of, of a student struggling with resources that could e easily be uh, repeated by any member of staff uh, within the university. They were asked to uh, think about how they would change that with some tips on how they could address that. And then a video resource that would explain how they could, they could address that particular issue with links out to the um, toolkits that we've made available. So we tried to pull it all together as a coherent package of resource and support. And the feedback has been quite frankly amazing in terms of uh, a mandated course to the point where staff have been encouraging other staff, the colleagues and peers to, to adopt uh, this, uh, this training uh, and to actually take it and, and, and experience it. We've in one month, 550 staff uh, using the uh, resource, which is probably 25-30% of its target audience, uh, but particularly around the academics, you can see that's a, a huge adoption. Um, and we've been very pleased with that, that kind of real life scenario based approach. But we've also been very uh, hands on in terms of the uh, uh, support we provide. So we've been Blackboard, we have created uh, accessible templates that we've rolled out this year so that every new module site has an accessible baseline template uh, with that, uh, that has it uh, demonstrates best practice and it's been restructured with clear signposting and resources built into it to enable every uh, member of staff starting from uh, this academic year to have a, a, a highly accessible plat baseline platform on their Blackboard site that they can use then to uh, add the resources onto to ensure that we have a high level of accessibility. And I think we're around on, on Blackboard Ally around 76% uh, across the site. Uh, with the resources, they can see they're around 71%. So um, that's really pleasing. Uh, a comparable level of uh, three years ago, uh, two years ago, sorry, uh, which is uh, the nearest we can get to, to compare is uh, saw us around 46, 47%. So we're keen to see that there's an improvement, but we need to monitor this over the coming year so that we can um, review uh, just how uh, impactful this has been. Andy, um, that's great. That's been a whistle stop tour. It has. I was waiting for the halfway mark, so I knew where it was. But I, I did it. I, I did. It. So, uh, <laughs> Sorry, you must have missed it. Yeah, the little the little dingle bell did go at the halfway mark. Oh, uh, I, I missed that. I was too busy <laughs> writing it. Anyway, uh, so for my fellow presenters, listen out for that. Um, but just want to leave you with this. That's a web resource. That's the training. That's the top tips, and that's the accessibility resources. Mm -hmm. If you want to make a note of those, I would just ask people not to tweet this particular link if you uh, are interested in it, but I give it to you so you can actually take the training. But because, because we've mandated it, we do not want to confuse our staff by having a publicly available resource yeah. uh, available when uh, they have to go through the CPD site and their, and their, their use is tracked, but sorry. Yeah, That's excellent. Uh, really helpful. And I think there'll be lots of comments and things. I, I understand that you've got to disappear um, shortly, but Michael, your colleague, still going to be here. And if, Michael, if you could pop those links uh, from there into the text chat, that would be really good. Um, and we're going to just because of the speed, we're trying to get through the different people. I'm going to pass on to Lillian to pass on to Penny. But please, if you've got questions, 
comments, put them into the text chat because hopefully uh, Michael can answer those as we go through and Andy while he's still here. And we're, we always aim to end just a little bit before two and then we hang around for time to chat with people afterwards and that can be a good point as well. So excellent, thank you very much, Andy. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, and I'm now uh, going to introduce Penny Spikins uh, from the University of York, a lovely colleague that I had the opportunity to speak mm -hmm. to recently um, because we were working uh, together to help uh, one of her visually impaired students on her archaeology course. So that's quite a challenge. So we'd love to hear from Penny now uh, uh, on um, how she's doing with that. Over to you, Penny. Thanks, Lillian. Okay, if you could just share the screen for me then. I think Ron's going to do that, Ron. I can do that otherwise. I've got, oh great, okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, so why are we looking at a really dark picture of something in a coal mine? Well, that's because I'm just going to be telling you about my experience over the past few months about creating accessible resources. This seems a bit negative, doesn't it? But like it will get to a positive thing because it's felt like a little bit about being at the coal face of teaching preparation. Um, trying to turn, if you could click for me, please, this kind of thing into, if you could click again, this kind of thing is quite a challenge. Now, in my particular case, it was quite a large challenge because my research area is human origins. So I do the archeology span of human origins and you think, well, why would that be a problem? That's because nobody wants the origins of anything to come at the end of anything. So I'm always on first, which means I have really top heavy autumn term teaching. So I have courses at first year, second year, third year, master's level in autumn term. And I had to prepare 2,160 minutes of pre-recorded content and 600 of that is new material. Okay, so that's actually already looking like quite a challenge, isn't it? And thankfully we had some great resources from our learning team of which um, Lillian's a part. And I actually attended them twice. So I'm probably one of the few staff that just went to everything two times. So I was sure I'd got it right. Um, but for an added complexity, there's quite a lot of accessibility issues around a lot of uh, the resources that I prepare. And they're not just about student issues. So I have dyslexia and Erlen syndrome myself. So I can't look at the screen too much or I'd have to use the green screen. But you can't do that when you're when you're recording because it comes up green. Um, and also, you know, I'm not going to be doing a lot of text heavy stuff in all of this huge amount of preparation. Um, but also because some of my research crosses over into disability or because I declare a disability um, or because or for whatever reason, I'm not sure entirely now, I often seem to attract quite a number of students, particularly at master's level, who have disabilities themselves to come on my courses. So that means that I often have a range of accessibility issues that I also have to deal with as well as having my own accessibility issues. So I'm hoping that my experience is sort of interesting for you to give you some ideas about this. And a particular challenge I've had this year is I've got one master's student who's blind. So you know, I need to be preparing resources that work for them. Um, and another one has a hearing impairment. Now, obviously, everything already has to be captioned, but I need to think carefully about that as well. OK, so I kind of started, thank you, Lillian, to think, well, OK, it's important to think about what's changing here and what I can do. We're losing a lot from the lecture theatre. We're losing the being in proximity to other people. Le a lecture is a kind of a bit of a theatre and I always did well with that. I always had that good interaction with people. Um, and I talk about something topical in the news or a recent publication every week and kind of make that a focus. And of course I can't do that because I've got to pre-record everything. So this, we've lost something of a theatre here that we sort of can't avoid thinking about. But at the same time, we've gained something as well because we're gaining a capacity to sort of get people to dream and imagine in a way that they never do in a lecture room surrounded by people who are all kind of very conscious of each other's proximity and visibility. So you can sort of start to encourage people to dream and imagine. Um, you 
can, of course, there's all the traditional things. They can do a bit, look at a bit of a resource. They can stop. They can have time to think. Um, although I have to produce an hour, I don't have that constant tyranny. I'm terrible with time, as I've already told Lillian about, and spend half of my lectures thinking, how many minutes? How many minutes? You know, I don't have to worry about that. I'm going to record sections and then by the time I get to the end I've, I've got to the end of my sections so there's actually but but we can't do I can't do all these wonderful resources that we've seen that are absolutely perfect because I've got 2160 minutes to get done okay so I have to think about what advantages I've got and some of my advantages actually come from my dyslexia okay and that is that I often think quite creatively and imaginatively about certain topics I've also had a lot of experience in podcasts and radio interviews so actually I'm already okay at discussing things off the bat without a lot of preparation um, and I've also had experience with what you tend to do on radio, which is describing the visual. It's already not too unfamiliar for me. Archaeology is quite a visual topic, but to make that communicatable to someone with a visual impairment, I need to be able to describe artifacts in an interesting way. So I've already had some experience about that. So I kind of looked quite hard, looked at some inspiration. Lillian helped me with some hints from other academics. And so I developed lecture resources that work both as, if you could click for me, please, Lillian, a lecture and a podcast. Um, and they've, as I carried on recording, the text on the text on the slides just reduced. If you could click again, please, Lillian, and then again. And the text on the slides just went down and down and down because I realized it was all in the captions. They can download the captions. And this is, a lot of them are looking at things on their phone. So my whole what I was showing um, on a slide just changed completely as I went along as well. But I also started um, by focusing on one thing. So I might say, uh, you know, from the bottom one, I'll sort of then get people to think creatively, like say, okay, this, this just looks like some any old piece of rock. You know, it's just got a couple of flakes off it. But I can tell you that it's two and a half million years old and it's made by someone who isn't really human, but maybe isn't not human either are they just another ape or are they really showing some signs of something unique so actually by visually describing something and i would go into a longer description than i did for you there and then thinking about points i've sort of changed a lot of the way that a lecture works so it becomes a little bit more like a podcast yeah um, and so also what helps is I really can't do this much material and make it perfect. So what I like about some podcasts is they incorporate some of that mistakes, if you like, or little mistakes. And one of the things that's been incredibly popular with my mistakes is the presence of the dog as a constant presence <laughs> coming in and out of my podcast, of which prob probably the most famous example um, is when on um, my lecture recordings was when I was doing my recording of you know tips on essay structure so I start my recording on tips on essay structure and I'm using a uh, you know I'm, I'm also drawing as well as having something on the video and then you hear in the background and I think okay fine so I say okay I'm just going to stop here I'll never get all this done if I keep stopping I'm there's no time to record to re-record and I move the camera over and you've got a picture of my dog drinking my tea on the desk which is like quite funny anyway that's not the end of the story because that was hilarious video which also told people about you know essay tips uh, but then the third years who had this video on one of the modules were asked have any of the staff produced any lecture material or any additional material that you really felt everyone should see because it's just been really, really useful? So what do they say? Penny's essay tips video. So the head of teaching comes, oh, here you've done a really great thing on structuring essays. I'm like, yeah, you should watch it first. I'm not sure that the reason, I mean, not that I'm bad at talking about structuring essays, but I'm not sure that the reason why they like it is really 100% to do with my tips on essays. I think it's a lot to do with the dog. Anyway, so how has this uh, really gone down? I mean, I think I've got better as I've gone along, but um, I'm also 
trying to encourage them to be aware of the fact that they can download everything uh, as a, uh, a podcast. So I do human origins, obviously. So I tell them about the fact that nobody ever sat down in the past at all. And it's obviously bad for us for that reason. So getting out and about is good. And I was interested to see whether students who didn't have accessibility issues would actually benefit from the way in which I'd redesigned the course to take into account some of the accessibility issues. Okay, so if you could just pass on to the next slide. I don't mean necessarily to read these all out, but <laughs> this is some of the response I got from a group of 30 students who are second year students. They don't have any particular accessibility issues, but I'd done the same thing for all of my courses. There was no time to be messing around with doing things differently. Everything was going to work like a podcast um, and be described visually. And actually, they all actually really loved it. So I, I found that your lectures are easier to engage with than in other modules. And I've had lots of other feedback saying, oh, I really enjoyed it. And I think it's that visual part at the start. And I think also what I'm doing is there's an analytical part and a creative visual part. And I alternate between the two. And in a way, it sort of gives different parts of your brain a chance to like relax. So when I'm talking to you about what an artifact looks like or what something else looks like, that part of your brain is working. And then when I'm talking to you about, oh, these are the dates and the sequences you need to know, that part of your brain is working. So I think they've, they've found it really, really engaging. And I think they didn't all, I asked them if they, how many use the podcasts, I would say maybe 25%, but still, that's still quite a lot. And then their comments were, you know, okay, I don't think, I, some of them say, well, I'm a visual learner. I don't think I'll do it like that. Others of them would say, actually, I really like them. I might give them a go now. Yeah, I'm going to have them. A go. I'll give them a go. And then one said, I said, no, but I might start doing it more as they're, as they're helpful. I'm just not used to it. You know, I haven't used the podcast yet, but I like the option. So they actually really liked something that was designed about someone who was blind, but gave them the option to go out for a walk, which we all know we kind of need to do, um, and listen to their lecture. And the captions as well, obviously the captions are a huge amount of effort, but they really do pay off. So I'm finding at least a third, sometimes a half the students are watching with captions on. Um, and like they say, they like the captions. They don't feel they miss anything. The captions are useful. It's meant I have to put, I don't have to put so much text on the screen because it's going to come up in a caption and they can download those. Um, so I think that's gone really well. And in fact, the GTA on the course had, I'm not sure whether this is a, this is actually a, uh, a positive thing or not, but they said they'd heard my lectures before, which have changed a bit when they were an undergraduate. And I'd shared them into the recorded lectures from last year before I got everything finished so they could prepare for the course. And then they looked at the properly recorded lectures actually online on the VLE and they said oh they're so much better the properly recorded lectures they're much easier to understand than when you're in the lecture room and I really you know there's part of me that goes oh that's fantastic so everyone's enjoyed it much better with these resources they like the resources better this is great on the other hand there's a part of me that's thinking what was I doing wrong in the lecture room hey why why did you why is why is this better I thought I was good in the lecture room but at the same time I quite enjoyed I'm quite pleased with the fact that they are really enjoying it it's difficult you're talking to the void like on radio or like I'm doing now um, and that's a difficult thing to do but at the same time I've had a really good feedback from doing this differently this isn't a lecture I'm not really just putting my lectures online I'm creating something new around them anyway thank you I'd love to hear your thoughts that's brilliant. That's brilliant, Penny. It's um, you can hear your enthusiasm, and I love the fact with this slide as well. Um, you know, we we know that um, from Hattie's visible learning, you're you're trying to work out if the students are benefiting from your different approach, and you can see that they're they're definitely kind of taking that on board, aren't they? Yeah. Um, and and so part of the thing is making them aware of of the different differences so if people like to put questions in the chat for penny to engage with uh, next up we have dr javaria shah hello can you hear me okay we can yeah. hear you and we can great. see you great wonderful um so i'm just going to start sharing my screen Oh, and just to, to let you know, Javeria, we do a halfway, uh, a five minute mark, I'll ring a bell and Lillian might ring as well because 
people haven't been hearing my bell. And then um, the the last minute, uh, when there's a minute left, we'll ring it again. Sure, no problem. Um, that's really helpful, actually. Thank you. <laughs> can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Wonderful. Perfect. Well, before I start, I'd like to show you this little promotional video that we did this year, uh, post-COVID lockdown, uh, for all our students, uh, our new students especially, so they know what the programme is and, and, and what it's about. And then I'll give you a little bit more information and, and detail on that. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to press play. Uh, can I? Yes. Uh, no, if, if, if it was just that the volume wasn't loud enough, that's fine. Turn the volume off. Otherwise, stop the sharing and share the screen with there's a little tick box that includes share system sound. Share system. Right. Is, 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 is there? Is try, there pl try playing it again. Just see if okay. we can. Sound. Okay. Yeah, no, we're, we're not hearing the sound. So never mind. If, so stop, stop the sharing, and then when you share again, there's a little tick box at the bottom left that says also share system sound or include system sound or something like that. Okay. Off my screen for video. Um, I'm actually, ironically, going to be talking to you about using digital technology. So this is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I can assure you that it works better for the students. <laughs> right, let me try again. Can you see the Thank stop you. sharing bit? I've, I've done the stop. Because we're still seeing You're your still screen. You're still seeing my screen, yeah. are you? Okay. Sorry, bear with me. That's it. Now do the share again and click the little tick box, share system sound. Okay, share again. And, and before you click on, you know, once the dialogue comes up, there's an option, um, little checkbox share system sound now try it fingers crossed you simply yeah, move perfect yeah perfect so i'll just start that from the beginning it's not a very long video so um here we go when procrastination kicks in it's like you're floating in the wind and as the blurry thoughts appear in your mind aka confusion you simply move with it instead of doing something practical about it the thing is you can do it, but the words are just not there. The desperate attempt at typing a paragraph but erasing it all seems best? Don't worry, you're just in time. Here at Learning Skills, we got you covered with our academic expertise easily accessible to you. We specialise in a range of disciplines, which includes academic writing, organisation and time management. You can find a full list of our services in our handbook on Brightspace. As a student at Central, you can access the Learning Skills Programme remotely. So forget all the distractions and book a session with us today. Simply email learning.skills at cssd.ac.uk. Our team are here and ready to help. Follow us on Twitter at CSSD Learning. Learning Skills, the department which assists you with all your academic needs. So um, that when was just a bit of an overview of the Learning Skills Programme, which I am Programme Leader for. Um, we offer learning development to the full student body at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama, um, which is part of the University of London Federation. Uh, we're quite unusual in that we don't have a um, direct connection with the Dyslexia and Disability Service. So we're a standalone learning development area. Um, and we have, I guess, an unusual pressure to be in credit, it, it, to, to have inclusion embedded in, in, in all of our areas, um, because obviously it's, it's being accessed by the full student body and, and everybody will have um, varying different needs. So my own background is from the further education sector. And for those of you that are familiar with the UK FE sector, you will know that there is no such thing as disability students allowance. And uh, there was always a pressure to incorporate what we well, were back in the 90s it used to be called differentiation so to be able to incorporate an inclusive model into your teaching and learning and have that embedded without any sort of additional resources so that is a um an experience that's hold, held me in good stead to some degree in in a being able to sort of approach this uh, this program leadership that i do so um there's many different aspects to the program and i'll save you you know sort of having to go through all it they just haven't got the time but the focus for today's session really is on how I've incorporated the use of assistive technology 
and free wear into the program to enable learners to be able to more um, accessibly access um, time management and organization um, approaches to their academic work. So uh, just to give you a bit of context, sorry, uh, before I do that, I'm just trying to see if I've got everything here. Yes, okay. <laughs> to give you a little bit of context, it's actually, I, my story is quite similar to, to yours, Penny, in that I'm dyspraxic. Um, so I, I guess, plan and organize in a way that I would also learn, which, which helps sometimes, uh, especially when you're working with neurodivergent learners. I um, was diagnosed quite late, around sort of 2015, as I was uh, writing up my PhD, and I realized that I was one of those self-managing sorts of learners. So I didn't actually know that I had a learning difference until quite late in life and realized that I had been quite high functioning uh, because I sort of, I guess I had to be. Um, so I'd find, I'd found all these techniques and ways of managing without realizing that it was something that I was explicitly doing to, to deal with the learning difference. And one of these things was um, acquiring skills in um, well, technology. I found technology incredibly useful. Now, I'm not digitally literate and I'm definitely not part of the internet generation. So a lot of these things have been self-taught. And uh, once I was diagnosed um, and under the DSA, I, I was able to access um, a range of assistive tech. So it was a really interesting insight into what our neurodivergent students might might be able to access in terms of support and services outside of the university. But it also gave me a sense of how useful assistive technology can be in enabling um, better organization and time management for all learners. So um, I'm going to draw your attention now to um, this area here, which is on the virtual learning environment. So I have a section on the virtual learning environment, um, which is accessible to all staff and students. And as a result of this, um, Every time I put an announcement out, for example, it, it reaches everybody, which, which can be quite handy. Um, the section I'm drawing your attention to is digitally organizing your academic writing and research. And I have been managed, well, just through my own research, um, I've been managed to, I've, I've been managed, oh, sorry, slip there. I've been able to access a range of freeware that can better help and assist students. Uh, so I'm gonna just show you a few examples. Um, the first one is Pacemaker. Pacemaker is a really useful tool in um, enabling students to ascertain uh, and determine writing targets. So this could be relating to a specific assessment, or it could be relating to a, a more long term goal, such as a dissertation. So um, just to very quickly give you a bit of a demonstration on that, uh, what you can do, for example, is you might write down what the, um, the name of the assessment is. You'd write down the status of the work, so it could be drafting, editing, and, and so on. I, I'll keep it to drafting. It gives you uh, the option of changing the format. So we've got blog posts, comics. You'll see. I mean, there's there's a huge array of options here. At Royal Central, we might choose script. Um, the amount of work which can be determined based on words, paragraphs, etc. So there's a, again a huge uh, number of options there that you can choose from. Um, I might make it 10,000 and that's my overall target, though you may be able to set it to a daily target. You can select the date that you begin work on this project. It could be today and you select a finish date. So that could be quite late, say like 16th of December. And then here on the left, you have these options which um, help you choose how you want to approach the actual writing. So it could be steadily, or um, rising to the challenge, you get the picture. I'm quite a fan of oscillating <laughs> or random. Maybe that's the dyspraxic in me, I don't know. Um, and what that does is it, it just allows you to determine the pace at which you want to work. You can yeah, also- Sorry, can I just say, I don't think my bell has been coming through the system for some no, reason, it hasn't. but um, there's two minutes left. Okay, thank you. Um, you're also able to choose the intensity um, and then you're able to also customize it based on, you know, eliminating particular dates uh, or weekends where you may not be able to work. And you can also reserve extra days in case you want to have a little bit of wiggle room to, to, to make changes. You can also choose how you want the, the targets to be displayed. I'm quite a fan of the table. Um, and you can choose when your week begins. 
So this should just sort of give you a bit of a rough idea, but it's it's completely it's a completely free tool and you can just sign up for it and um, it, it helps you determine your writing targets because I've chosen randomly, it's given me these targets in this way. But if I was to choose something like this, my targets would change. So this is just an example of the types of um, technolo technologically aided organization and time management support that's given to our students. And this, they find it incredibly useful, especially as, because, as we have um, a very high proportion of our learners who are neurodivergent. Um, so they do, they're, they're either already familiar with assistive technology or they respond quite well to it. So they find this kind of um, input really helpful. There were other examples, which I'm happy to share through links in, in chat. Uh, but that was just to give you a bit of an idea of how digital technology is used in the program. That's great, Javeria. Thank you very much for that. And the thing, I mean, I popped a note in the group chat uh, a moment ago. The thing that I think is quite special about the work that you've been doing is that there are very few study skills departments I've looked at that actually have digital study skills embedded. And that's something I was really keen for people to be aware of so if you do have any other links you could pop in there sure. that would be great and there will be people um i'm sure if people have got questions keep those in the chat pane and javeria will respond to those as we go through and i'm really sorry about the bell i think the, the must i've been ringing it but every presenter's not heard it and i think maybe my audio system's not you know not picking up the uh the tone i'll get myself a better bell and what I'd like to do now, if so, keep any questions coming for uh, Javeria in the chat pane. And I'm going to introduce Sammy, uh, Sammy White from Leeds City College. And Sammy's going to be talking about something I know is very specific to a lot of people where you're trying to teach STEM subjects and you're trying to get your head around the accessibility issues of STEM. So, Sammy, over to you. And um, I'll, I'll go ding dong halfway through instead of ringing my bell. <laughs> Okie dokes. <laughs> okay, hi everyone, I'm Sammy. I'm from Leeds City College. Um, I'm an advanced practitioner for technology enhanced learning, um, but my subject that I teach is maths. So I think that's where it particularly crosses over here. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you today about um, some software that we use from Texthelp called Equatio. Um, and what we found was that 60% of our learners with additional learning needs were cited within our curriculum areas, not within our specialist provisions. And so we needed a tool that would provide that discreet and timely support. Um, and we really found that Equatio could do that. We found that there was a lack of awareness um, with curriculum staff about additional learning needs and in particular with the maths teachers that I work with, um, a lack of awareness of the challenges dyscalculia would present um, a learner when sat in a maths lesson. Um, so what we decided to do was do a campaign across the college, um, just sort of promoting um, dyscalculia, how that would look, how that would feel and things like that. So I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay, so um, we did some little graphics like this with some facts and figures and things like that. Um, and it says a person with dyscalculia um, may have a poor sense of number and estimation. It gives a strategy to adopt, which is to use visuals to aid where possible. And that's where Equatio comes in. So we had it hyperlinked to what's called a math space in Equatio. And it's basically a, a blank page or a slide deck or anything like that, um, where you can create um, all sorts of wonderful things. And um, you're going to see all sorts of bits here. but. Um, this one that I just wanted to quickly show you is that you can create visuals nice and easily in it and they're draggable, droppable and every which way in betweenable. Um, so what we're able to do is just get the learners to sit with their Chromebook in their mainstream lessons. And then as they're counting or as they're wanting to do things, they can just drag and drop these nice and easily. And these are just fraction bars that create from here. And obviously with Equatio, it is fully accessible. So it will read it out for you. Um, so um, it's it's really, really powerful. I've just realised you're not going to hear that because I've got my headset on, so we'll take that off as we go through. Um, so 
that was really successful for us as a team in that we were able to get um, staff on board and supporting learners in the classroom. And then it was about how to um, put it into my own practice. And um, so currently I'm teaching a, a student called Sam. And um, Sam has dyscalculia, dyslexia, autism, ADHD, and another additional learning, forgive me that I can't remember that right at this moment. And I'm teaching Sam fully remotely, GCSE Maths. It is Sam's sixth or seventh attempt at GCSE Maths. Um, and so I really wanted to get it right. So what we've been doing is we've been using equation in the classroom um, to help Sam clearly plan his answers and write his working out down. So one of the brilliant features of Equatio, and I'll just flick to this one here because it'll just show it here, is that you can um, click the Equatio mobile tool and it will link to your mobile phone, the document you're working on on the screen. Um, and then you can finger write or speak your maths or science in, you can save it as an image or you can convert it into maths and Equatio will do that for you. Um, so this is just a little screenplay of my mobile phone going through these tasks. Um, but I'm more than happy to give more information for anyone who wants to look at it. But I just wanted to show you um, how easy it is. So you scan there and it opens up on your mobile phone, the document you're working on, on your Chromebook or your PC, whatever it is. And it will say, do you want to insert this maths into there? And that way you can take a photo of your work or you can finger write your work. You can see there it's linked to the active documents just there. Um, so you can take a photo of your work or you can finger write your work and it's really powerful. So I just wanted to show you something that um, happened last week for us. I've obviously I've anonymized it so it just shows more recent than that. So I'd set this question here, um, a traditional maths question and that's just an image that I've inserted. And then this is the work that the student has done, the handwritten work. And the handwritten work has been converted into maths. And what this helps is promote those high standards for that learner in that if it can't understand what they've written, then an examiner probably won't understand what they've written. And then I can then click it. Obviously, I've anonymized it earlier on in the week and I've given them next steps and added comments on it in there. So we're taking the paper based task and we're bringing it really online in the truest sense um, in that that paper can be lifted in. Now it can go in as an image like that and obviously you can see the image is a lot clearer than it would usually be. That's because of the way the software works but it also converts into maths as well. Um, so it allows Sam in particular to have maths read back to him um, and so I'll demo that in a second for you and gives him that power to learn asynchronously and um, that he's really not had before and um, just to say on Equatio as well it does go in tab order so if a learner uses switches um, it does go in tab order so it's really accessible for everyone um, so I just wanted to show you I'll drop this into the chat as well I made a little book on a book creator and um, for our staff of just how to use Equatio and it links to some videos and things like that so I will share that in the chat box once I finish as well I'm just um, doing the just, halfway mark ding dong okay fab. thank you so I just wanted to quickly show you what it looks like so I'm just going to click the um rhombus here and it is a rhombus not a diamond as my five-year-old's been told at school um so clicking the rhombus so the equation has now opened up and the first thing I always go to is the equation editor and you can just type in so I could type in three over and it's already picking up when I say over, does it mean a fraction line? And I do, so I can write three over four. So when it sees over, that's what it means. You can be a lot fancier than, than this. Um, you can actually divide in or things like that. You can put fraction in, um, but if you really want it, I'll just show you, you can put quarter, quantity, or the actual big guy, the quadratic formula, it'll pop it all in. It's quite intuitive as well. You can favorite things as well. If you use latex, um, you can put latex in. There's a graph editor, handwriting recognition. So I am on a touch screen, so I will just try that now. So just bear with me. This is where it could all go wrong. So you can see it's picked up there a zero. And then if I wanted to do an X, is it going to pick it up? Hey, it's picked up an X as well. So there's all sorts of things. Um, and then I can speech talk my maths in as well. So I could do this one here. I'll just clear off that zero X because that makes no sense. Here we go. Three X add two. So it's picked it up as time. So I didn't want that. So we'll try again. <laughs> Always the way, isn't it? Three X add two. 
it's still picking up at the times. Anyway, uh, you get the idea. It did pick up as next first, but uh, yeah, it is normally much better than that. I wonder if it's because I'm doing the Zoom as well at the same time. Um, so you can do that. That's the mobile feature that I was talking through earlier. That's the work that you saw from Sam. So you, they just scan that on their phone and then it goes through. Uh, Math space is where I showed you the manipulatives that drag around. Um, and then screenshot readers where you can just grab maths as well. So it, it covers everything so i just really wanted to show you some inaccessible maths and what that looks like for a learner so if a learner is using a screen reader or something like that this is not going to be read out as maths to them um, unless they use a tool like equatio so if we flick equatio on i'm just going to get the screenshot reader and i'm just going to click over this bit here so it's going to look for some maths in there 20m over 5. And so it reads it aloud for the learner. The learner can then copy that, put it in another document, um, all sorts of bits and pieces. So that inaccessible maths document in that PDF um, has now become accessible for absolutely everybody. Um, so I'm just sure that it wasn't a fluke. We'll do another one. That looks a bit trickier. Let's see if we can do this one. 12y squared division sign 2y. Perfect. So what we can do then is you can copy the latex from there. We can go back into here and we can go to the latex editor and we can just paste that in and then that'll just insert it into the document. Um, and so that will then drop in. It's just going to do it now. There we go. So that's now dropped in. Now mine is set to large font just because I'm demoing today. But there are options in Equatio here where you can change the um, font size. Um, so if we go into here, I'm on extra large, but you can make it small, regular large, XX large. You can have predictions on and off. So if you're wanting to develop memorization of formula, things like that, you can turn that off. Um, and then the toolbar options can be customized as well. So if those options are too many and overwhelming for your learners, depending on their needs, you can customize it for them as well. So that was just a little whistle stop tour of what Equatio is, what it does. Um, and then, um, yeah, I'll answer any questions in the chat now. That's excellent. Thank you very much, Sammy. And um, it was a whistle stop, but it was really helpful and brilliantly to time. So thank you. Um, there are lots of things in the text chat. So I think if you if you want to have a look through there, there may be some specifics there. Um, and Ron, do you want to lead us in the last 10 yeah, minutes? Yeah, can I just check your seeing my shared screen now? With I'm the seeing your shared screen open mic. Yep. Okay. Um, thank you so much to each of our guest presenters. And we, we hope you've been as inspired as we have and impressed with their efforts and their examples. And so <laughs> that, uh, that sounds to me like Penny's dog. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we're, we're hoping that you um, might be inspired enough to share your experience in one of the future um, future teacher sessions. So we have that listed on screen there as long along with a, uh, an email link or a contact us button that you can use to contact us. I would encourage you to think about um, each of those topics and whether you'd like to uh, do a, a short guest slot like you've seen today on any of those topics and your experience. Um, we'd invite each of our guest speakers today to open their microphones so that they can respond to any questions. And also, if you've been um, actively sitting in the chat pane and responded and you have a, a burning question or something to share, then perhaps if you indicate either using the emoticons if you see them or um, just by typing something, um, you can open the mic and we'll, we'll allow you to um, kind of share verbally what you wanted to ask or what you wanted to share. So it's kind of a bit of a, an open mic discussion, but there's um, 60 plus people in the room. So obviously we can't all um, open our mics and talk at the same time. But if you have something you want to share or if any of the guest speakers want to add anything that's occurred to them since the other presentations, then, um, you know, please do. It's a bit of a, a kind of open slot for us to discuss um, key points that people are interested in. And also while you're doing that and thinking about that, I've just popped the link to the um, the resource, the original resource, which is at the end of it, it's got our kind of future teacher reactivated.
bit. So don't forget about that as well. Have a look through that if you want to. And Darren, the recording of this session will be um, either later this week or early next week in, embedded in that same page. So thanks, Darren, for that question, for Sammy for answering that. Any others on that? Um, and, and equally, bring in any questions from any of our presenters. You've seen everything from, you know, the individual work with individual students through to kind of departmental wide learning skills and so on through to, you know, the whole strategic approach. While people are thinking about those questions and adding them to the text chat, I will just um, navigate on them while I'm sharing my screen to the, the remaining pages. Um, we have uh, a would you like to go on a journey and the step by step instructions on to uh, how to access our mini courses or journeys as we called them. So you can access that in your own time and um, discover those. There's a there's a page about us and if you wanted any additional help with um, future teacher resources and topics, then our contact details are listed there. Uh, we have a next step, which again repeats the fact that we'd like to hear from you if you'd like to do a guest slot and um, the working with Rich Media Images is our next session. So we'd be particularly like to hear from you if you're interested in um, sharing your experience of that. Um, we do have a final activity before you go, but we'll come back to that. And there's a final page about this resource. We use a tool called Xerti, um, which has high level of accessibility. Um, and you can read about some of that there. So um, there's a table of contents where you can navigate to any of the pages. So I'm going to just go back to the open discussion. Um, Alistair Lillian, have you got anything to add before we do the final activity? Uh, no, um, just that there have been so many lovely links shared and we'll um, add those back into the speaker pages on this future teacher resource. So don't feel you have to worry about any resources being lost. We'll, we'll add them back uh, into the resource for the speakers. And for me, I think the only thing is I would I'm always interested in what other organizations are doing. So if anybody is doing something similar, to what Andy's doing or completely different and ditto um, in terms of uh, what Javeria was showing with study skills and indeed what any of our speakers are doing if you've got something where you're thinking oh, we do something a bit like that but we do it differently in this way then tell us about it um, uh, uh, all the value of this comes from the community that um, is sharing their good practices whether it's the speakers or the participants there's some questions in the chat about um, the accessibility of Padlet. And of course, we've used mm. Padlet in quite a few of the future teacher sessions and resources. Um, but we also have a session on um, uh, kind of evaluating, um, being savvy about the resources that you use. And I guess that kind of overlaps with um, that session a little bit, because partly it's about identifying the tool that's most appropriate. And accessibility is a very tricky area in that it's very easy to be accessible with a completely passive resource. Um, if it's just text and a couple of pictures, but teaching and learning is not just about giving people passive transmission of content. So when you're, I, I was interested in the ARCS model um, that Andy and Michael were talking about, because when you talk about designing for learning, you really are talking about, you know, grabbing people's attention, making things relevant. You're talking about building confidence and all sorts of things. And that's often involving a wide range of tools and interactivities, not all of which can necessarily be equally accessible to all people all the time. So being digitally savvy and knowing what you can use with the groups that you've got and how you would anticipate um, an alternative if you had somebody that couldn't use those, that's all part of that inclusion skill. Yeah, I, it's funny. Um, Padlet seems to to <laughs> Padlet seems to raise a lot of questions uh, at the uni. Um, there are people who really get their pitchfork out when we mention Padlet because it's not an accessible tool. And then when you dig deeper, um, I mean, you could create a word document and make it inaccessible. So 
it's about the practice really. Um, so not every tool is perfectly accessible, but the practice can uh, improve or uh, depress the accessibility uh, of a resource. Um, so yes, and, and I love Alistair's uh, quote there, uh, accessible to whom? Because the whole point of uh, a lot of tutors wanting to use Padlet is to improve the interaction, the ability for people to add text or pictures or voice or video. But there are lots of um, alternatives nowadays. So yes, being savvy about what tool you use is key. So yeah, I think Mike makes a good good point there. So not everything is accessible to the fullest extent, but I think, you know, give it a little bit of time. I think more and more things will uh, try and achieve the WCAG 2.1 AA standards. So things will get better. We're all struggling with captioning at the minute, for instance, but the technology will get better. Um, so I yeah. I think Man Mandy makes a really interesting point there as well that, and um, there are lots of tools with um, quite uh, quite disingenuous accessibility statements. I have seen so many products for so many years saying, you know, we um, we endeavour to meet WCAG 2.1 AA standards, and you you start actually doing some human testing on them, and they don't. Um, but I always feel that it's far better that if you're going to deal with a tool that's semi-accessible, and to be honest, a lot of tools are because we are still at an immature stage um, of the, you know, the legislation being picked up by institutions and by, by suppliers. We're still at an immature stage, so things are not going to be 100%, and there are some things that will never be 100% because you will never be able to substitute a particular um, perception or cognition if somebody hasn't got that then you know 3d virtual reality is never going to be easy and never going to add value if you can't see so it's those sorts of things there will be tools and there'll be partial accessibilities but the clarity of the accessibility statement helps you then anticipate whether or not that's going to be an issue for any students no students some students and it helps you mix and match how can I give the best experience to each of my learners, even if sometimes that's in different ways? So Lillian, do you want to um, reinforce that last message with audio? Yeah, just um, at the end of every webinar, we do like people to um, have a little think uh, about what they'll do with this information. Um, so even if you have to dash, um, do uh, come back and share a, a bit of a reflection on what you're going to do as a result of attending the session um, and try and make it more specific because that usually helps uh, people to uh, follow up. Um, and not forgetting that we have our self-access resource, but also the peer activity, which is really useful for opening up conversations with colleagues about how you will make adaptations or, or really change your practice over time to ensure that you include more learners. So this peer activity is really useful um, as a scenario, you know, it's almost like a what if situation, but it really prompts your thinking. Um, and I think I've had a lot of academics come to me this year and go, oh, I, I have a, a student who has hearing impairment or visual impairment. And they're only just kind of wondering how to uh, address um, or, or, or help um, uh, people to engage to the same level. And it would be really nice if you could use these scenarios to help everyone to prepare um, whether they have students with visual impairments, hearing impairments or physical impairments um, of, of some other kind. Um, because uh, yeah, uh, then you don't have to panic if it happens to you your resources are already of a standard that can be used by more people. Okay, so at this stage, we normally have a bit of a, an informal chat as people are leaving and I'll, um, shall I stop the recording now, Alistair, Lillian, do you think? Yeah, I think yeah. so, yep. yeah. <clears throat>